let's just figure this out for a second here. So you have essentially these, um, I, what is it, like uh, I guess uh, a dozen, 16 banks that um, voluntarily report on what their lending rates are, and that forms the basis of a, um, a rate in which everything else, or not everything else, but a lot of other financial products are based upon. And yeah, so mortgages, credit cards, swaps, all kinds of stuff, yeah. So the argument from the defense here is that, well, Bank A and Bank B, uh, was the, there was never a notion that they were competing against each other uh, in this right. process. They were just reporting on what, uh, on what their bank rates are, and this, this process was just used to form a, basically an aggregate or an average, more or less, of what that rate is. Right, right. But this is just semantics because, because obviously what they were supposed to be reporting was a competitive process. So, you know, when, when, you're, when you're reporting on what the rates are and what your borrowing costs are, it's supposed to be you're reporting on what the rate is in a competitive market, like how much it would cost for your bank to borrow uh, in a competitive free market. So, yes, yes, technically they're not competing in, in delivering the information to the LIBOR committee. <laughs> I mean, but they, they are competing in terms of, you know, how much it costs to borrow in the market. Uh, so it was like a leprechaun trick. I mean, it, it's hard, I, this is hard to explain on the radio, but it's, it's, it's literally just a bunch of, of wordsmithing to try to make the issue go away, and it worked. I mean, it's, just, it's, it was, it's kind of brilliant, actually. But, I mean, what, what, wasn't there a notion that when it became clear, well, I mean, look, who knows when it became clear that this, this was, uh, rigging was going on, but that uh, literally the Bank of England was basically saying to people who weren't sort of fudging their numbers enough, you should fund your, fudge your numbers. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, the, that, yeah, yeah that, that did apparently happen in 2008, yeah. Uh, but, I mean, so why, if it's not, if there's no dynamic, I mean, because if they're saying it's not a competitive process, right, they're basically saying there's no relationship between Bank A and Bank B that are submitting their numbers in that part of the process, then why would they feel pressured to change their numbers based upon what other banks are doing? Well, that's true, yeah. No, I mean, that, and, and that, that, uh, that, that does make sense. Look, they, there, there were two different types of manipulation that went on. There was kind of this group manipulation where um, everybody was sort of trying to make LIBOR look lower so that they would all look better and look healthier, and that's what the Bank of England wanted. They wanted, they wanted the banks to keep LIBOR low so that every, nobody would freak out and think um, that borrowing rates were through the roof because there was a lack of confidence in the market. Uh, and so that was like genuine collusion. I mean, that, that, was, that was sort of pure anti-competitive behavior. And then there was the other kind where it was just some schmo in a company, uh, who, uh, some trader who would tell the LIBOR submitter that he wanted a lower number that day uh, because he was holding, you know, swaps or whatever it was, and it would he he would win on the deal if LIBOR was was lower that day. Um, so sometimes it, it wasn't it wasn't necessarily a bunch of people working in concert. Sometimes it was just an individual bank. Uh, that was fudging the numbers all by itself. So there was sort of an argument there, but but still, it's still anti-competitive behavior to, to fake the numbers. Um, now, let me just, anyway. I want to read just, a, I want to quote from the exchange that you uh, reprinted in your piece between a trader and uh, someone who was responsible for submitting the LIBOR who was presumably trying to front run or something like this, right? Uh, um, right. And uh, uh, in other words, um, you know, they're, they're going to fudge what their numbers are so they can get in um, uh, and, and, and play the spread between what their reported numbers and what the real numbers are ultimately going to be. This is the Swiss franc trader. Can, it, it, this is done through, uh, I guess, uh, IM or email or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah, can like you, an IM. can yeah. you put in six million Swiss li uh, six M six month six month, six uh, month. Swiss LIBOR in low, please? Uh, and then the primary submitter says, "What's it worth?" And the uh, Swiss franc trader says, "I've got some sushi rolls from yesterday." Question mark. And okay. the primary submitter says, "Okay, 
low six month just for you. And the Swiss rank trader says, woohoo, that'd be awesome. I mean, this is just, <laughs> it's jaw dropping. Yeah, no, it's totally sociopathic. I mean, think, think about it. I mean, these two yahoos are like monkeying around with the, the DNA of the entire world financial system for like failed sushi. I mean, it's, <laughs> yes, I imagine I there was really no transfer that... of sushi at that point, too. It was basically the guy's way of saying, like, hey, I don't know. I won't come over and take a crap on your desk tomorrow. And the guy says, all right, well, in that case, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's offered you nothing. It's just like, just do me a favor. And right, right. the guy's like, all right, whatever. I mean, it's that sort of whimsical, uh, which is just sort of stunning uh, because it literally affects a 500 what is it, $500 trillion? Yeah, yeah, uh, $500 trillion worth of financial products. Um, you know, the estimates are there. You, you see some papers say $300 trillion, others say $800 trillion. Uh, the, EU, the EU says it's $500 trillion, so pick a number right in the middle. But it's, it's a huge amount of money, I mean, <laughs> because, because everybody is affected by LIBOR. Even people who don't hold LIBOR-based um, instruments, are still affected by it. Think if you think about it, because they they're also they uh, these uh, benchmarks affect the value of different currencies versus each other. So if you hold a you have a bank account in dollars and and they're monkeying around with with the Swiss franc, um, your dollars might suddenly be worth less than the Swiss Swiss franc. You know, by a fraction or more more than a fraction. So so if you have money at all, this stuff affected you, uh, all right. which is Crazy. Crazy. And so let's talk also now about uh, ICAP. Um, uh, what is, who is uh, this firm ICAP, and, and what, what do they do, and why are they being investigated? So they're, they're, a, um, they're a, a, a broker for interest rate swaps. Uh, so if you're a bank and you want to buy or sell uh, interest rate swaps. They're, this is the major brokerage through which you do those deals. Um, interest rate swaps are. Um, that's another huge market. I think. Uh, I think the number we quoted was 379 trillion uh, dollar market. Um, but they're typically a tool that that um, companies and towns and cities and countries um, use to manage their uh, their debt. Uh, so. Uh, the most common situation is if um, you know a town is, has a bunch of vari- a variable rate bond issue, uh, and they want to know exactly um, how much they're going to owe in the future, uh, rather than pay a floating rate uh, at, at the rate at which they borrowed, um, they will pay a bank to swap that debt into a fixed rate, and that's what that swap is. It's it's like a it's like a deal between two parties. One 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 side wants to get a fixed interest rate, the other side is going to risk the variable rate. Um, so it's so like it's a the, kind of contract. It's the functional equivalent of me going to a mortgage broker and saying, "I got this uh, this um, adjustable rate mortgage uh, three or four years ago. I'm a little bit worried about what's going to happen with interest rates in the next couple of years. So I'm going to switch to my 30 year mortgage." Now and uh, and then he bakes basically switches those those deals. Somebody buys the other mortgage essentially. Right, and then the the whole trick here for the from the bank side is, you know, we we want to look at our research about what interest rates are, and we will we'll calculate what the what the cost of your loan for the next ten years is, and then we'll try to figure out a number that's you know just high enough. But just higher than that, so that we make a, a nice, sizable profit on it. Um, so that, that's where the, that's where you make money on interest rate swaps is sort of the difference between the spread between what what the real changes in rates are and, and how much you're going to offer your client. Um, and uh, and so this is sort of an opaque market. And um, like like LIBOR, uh, the prices of um, of interest rate swaps are based on like a bench rate. Um, which they call is the fix, and so the, the, there's an investigation now into is the fix that's essentially identical to the LIBOR investigation where it's they it's convenient that they've already uh, named it uh, right the fix right yes. yeah, yeah, yeah exactly so yeah they, they they are apparently looking at whether or not 
the there are I think it's 16 banks that are involved in this one this one or 15 banks, um, many of them the same ones involved with the LIBOR panel. Um, whether they're manipulating um, that benchmark as well, so that that's that's part of the investigation. Um, and it's just another example of how you know this sort of financial in- infrastructure is unregulated and or self-regulated, uh, and uh, we have to rely on them to give us numbers when they have an incentive to game them. How how would we be affected by the um, the the benchmark rate for uh, for for uh, rate swaps? So let's say your town wants to to swap out its it's debt, uh, and it buys a swap from Goldman Sachs or from uh, you know J.P. Morgan Chase or whoever. Uh, and instead of paying a hundred million dollars over the next ten years, it ends up paying 120 million dollars. Uh, and so that 20 million dollars is going to come from somewhere. It's either going to be in from our tax dollars, or they're going to cut services, or whatever. Um, you know, that's that's an example of, of where it could come from. It, from a from a for a company, it would, it would be a, a more direct hit. You know, they instead of paying X rate to swap out uh, their loans and their, and their debt exposure, they would they might pay a higher rate. Uh, and of course, there might be some people who benefit from this as well. But but uh, typically, the banks do this because they're on the other side of the deal, uh, and um, if they are doing it, they're, they're probably doing it to to rig the numbers in their favor. Right, as opposed to you know we we rigged like it for our more. favor last month. This month we give back some. They probably yeah, exactly. don't say that. No. So, I mean, this is just sort of this is really um, stunning because the implication here is is that in any financial system where you have voluntary reporting, that. I mean, look, if they're lying about the LIBOR, uh, uh, the, 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 the rates that uh, constitute LIBOR, if they're lying about the rates that constitute is the fix, there's no reason to believe that in any, where, wherever we see any type of voluntary reporting, that they're not lying. Right. And the problem with that is that these kinds of benchmarks exist pretty much everywhere in the financial system. So whether it's gold or silver... Uh, certain kinds of commodities, you know, jet fuel, uh, heating oil, uh, except for a very few places in the financial system where you have like real time, real data. Uh, you know, most of the most of these systems are built around um, voluntary reporting benchmarks. So prices, you know, as one source said to me, you know, most in most places you don't have prices except by a bunch of guys getting together. <laughs> and that's and that's sort of the that's sort of the the problem is that you, know, you just never know what's real and what's not um, and it's kind of creepy to think about.